Welcome back. Sean here, Mountains Garage. Continuing on the TH-475 race transmission build. Today we're going to work on the drums, the direct and forward. I just unboxed the ATD, Automatic Transmission Design, billet, first gear leave, trans brake valve body. From the center support up, Regardless of the brand of valve body you have, you need to follow the instructions and do the modifications required, and they're all unique, so the instructions will be your friend. Let's take a look at this beauty. I love unboxing new things and finding decals. The first thing I do is throw all the other stuff to the side and go stick the decals on something that's not going to move in my shop. Makes me happy. But anyway, we have this beautiful piece of billet aluminum. Comes with the manual valve installed. Flip it over. Nothing but a bunch of passages. It has a plastic uh, check ball already glued into place right there so you don't lose it. Separator plate. We have one nice looking solenoid. Basically quality. A spring for the modulator valve we need to modify before we install it. Pressure regulator spring. And 16 direct clutch return springs. This is what I'm after today because I want to put them in my direct drum so I can install it. The instructions say to drill a bleed hole in the direct drum. 1 16th at a 45 degree angle. Leave the drum seal off, which is the center seal. Obviously, there's two seals on the piston. Set your direct clutch cl clearance to 50 or 70 thousandths. Pretty straightforward. Let's do the direct drum. I'm using this style of press to compress the drum springs. The trans brake direct clutch springs are pretty stout, so you need a pretty sturdy press. I press in close to this bend here. If you push out here, you'll likely bend the plate because they're that stiff. And as you're going down past the snap ring groove, be sure to wiggle this back and forth because this will get hung up in the snap ring groove and then you'll end up bending the plate as well. When you get the snap ring in place, it needs to go between the bumps. Then I relax the press, take it over the bench, and I always tap the snap ring in to make sure it's in 100%. I have new Teflon seals on the center support three of them. We've left the second one back off. I've glued them in place with green assembly goo because it's nice and stiff. And when I lower the direct drum in and I'm pretty sure it's home, I'll actually pull it back out to make sure the seals still look good and then drop it in for the final time. I just want to make sure I don't accidentally catch one of the new seals because I didn't have it glued in the groove well enough. I'm going to install the direct drum empty so I can grab it with my hand. With the clutches in there, there's no room for your hand out here and really no place to do it. So I just leave the clutches out and put them in afterwards. No big deal. Working on a transmission with the bell housing removed sure does make it a lot easier. Not that the bell housing really gets in the way, it just seems like you're working in a bowl. In this case, it's very comfortable to reach in. Uh, you can know this direct drums all the way in when you hear this And I wiggle it down in the first time like I said Which lines all the clutches up pulled it back out double checked that my Teflon seals are all in place which they were and if you're careful and you gently start the first clutch It'll just drop right down without a whole lot of wiggling on the second attempt The clutches I'm using for the intermediate Direct and forward, they're all made in USA, Ray Bestis, green waffles. They're probably a middle to high end of the road clutch. You can spend anywhere from you know, a dollar and a half to $10 a clutch. Many experts will tell you the choice of clutch material is only so important, not as important as proper hydraulics and clamping force. So I like these. I also like the smooth Alto high energies. Uh, there's lots to read about the waffle or the smooth as to which one gives you a more aggressive 
shift. Sky's the limit on information. Today, I'm using these and I've been totally happy with them. And I simply paint each clutch on each side with a lot of ATF and throw them in the drum. Final word on the direct drum. I think I forgot to mention, I had cut the piston to 600 thousandths when I put in the six clutches and six direct drum steels, the thicker ones. The forward drum is an ATI. It has their larger shaft with bigger splines. Excuse the rust, I gotta clean that up. This is just from sitting for a month. I did not put rust preventative on it when I assembled it. Tisk tisk. It contains the same six clutches that I use in the direct and six 77,000 steels. And I reviewed the video last night and I cut the piston to 582 thousandths. Originally, I assembled the forward drum with a Sonex thrust washer style billet forward hub. I upgraded what's normally a plastic thrust washer on this side to the brass thrust washer that you see and everything appeared normal. I was alerted to a deal on the Extreme Duty Sonex forward hub which is coated for wear and comes with a bear. You would think that they would just take this hub, machine it down and make it fit a Baron and you'd be done. The fur, nothing could be further from the truth. I know they had some other goals in mind, but every dimension, the heights here, the heights here, the length of the splines, everything's different. I know from assembling the transmission that when I install this one with a 90 thousandths pump shim, which is about halfway in the spectrum of selective washers, that my end play is perfect. Reading the instructions, they state you should not have to machine anything, but if you do, they give you a few suggestions of where you could take material off. I mocked up the transmission with this hub and a 62 thousandths pump shim, the thinnest that's available. And the only one I had, looks like it's made out of wood, but it was good for trial and error. And I, for all intents and purposes, had zero in play. Despite the suggestions on the instructions, I am not machining any other part of the transmission to make this fit. But I was able to machine this area here to accept a 90 thousandths, the most popular middle of the road pump shim in the spectrum of sizes and come up with acceptable end play. So it really wasn't a big deal to chuck this in the lathe and cut it, but just expect that if you're going to install it. And just to be clear, I'm cutting the area where the bearing sits. So on the pump, I can use this shim to set my proper end play. This is my front end play checking procedure. I bolt in half a pump so it's nice and flat for the dial indicator to sit on. I did not install a pump gasket. That's about three thousandths before you compress it. So it's gonna add a little bit. You, if you were to zero this and then jack up on the output shaft, you'll notice you lose most, if not all, of your rear end play. So you have to re-zero after you jack up on the output shaft. And then you can just pull up and down to check the end play. My rear end play that I checked the other day, I believe, was just a hair under five thousandths, which is fine with a roll of thrust bearing in the back of the case. And just now I measured about, well, if I include what a pump gasket might be, I'm going to call it twelve thousandths. So they say, they say that your front end play should be more than the back. So I satisfied that requirement. And the normal end play on the front would be three to twenty-four thousand. So I'm certainly in that range. I don't think I'd run three. I've never seen one that tight. When you grab a Turbo 400 core and just pull the input shaft in and out, you'll see it has from the factory quite a bit of end play, more than they really spec. So in today's video, in the previous video yesterday, I probably said the word end play 50 times, and I'm glad I don't have to say it anymore. We're done with end play. There is so much more to talk about, research, 
the whole rollerizing thing. We'll, we'll get back on the rollerizing subject when we get back to the Turbo 400 because that wasn't necessarily as advertised. I think it should have had at least one more roller baron. But you haven't seen it all yet, so I, I promised I wouldn't talk about that Turbo 400, but I had to mention it. So do your own research. Man, there are volumes written on ways you can improve or change the Turbo 400 thrust. Uh, me, if I wanted to hillbilly it up for you, I mentioned it the other day. When I put a roller baron and select a shim for the lower unit, and I chuck it in the case and I can tighten the bolt and put the bevel snap ring in and it still turns and it's not loose, it's probably good. And when I put the pump in and I can go clunk clunk on the input shaft a little bit, it's probably good. <laughs> Measuring tools are great and I use them, but I'm telling you, it's kind of like if you do a hundred rear ends, you probably can feel what 8,000's backlash is in your hand. So uh, take that for what it is. Develop a feel, move on. That ends today's video. Next is the front pump and bell housing installation. And then we'll finish it up with the, probably Monday or Tuesday, Tuesday, because tomorrow's Monday, the valve body, rear servo, valve body, filter, pan, tail housing, done. Like, share, subscribe. I'll catch you soon.